A Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for A Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to once again be joined by Kevin Graham for our regular feature podcast, Scream Celica. Kevin, how are you? Not too bad Paul, um, how's yourself? I'm doing okay and I'm looking forward to yet another album from your collection. Tell us who it is and when it was released. I have been looking forward to doing this album actually Um, So the album was released on the 8th of September 2008 And it's by Glass Vegas And it's a debut album, Glass Vegas A bit of a story behind this Even though the album was released in September 2008 It makes more sense in my timeline the year before Glass Vegas were one of the first bands who uploaded a lot of stuff onto MySpace uh, when that was still a thing uh, I actually think Bebo was still a thing at this point And I got into them then It was my, my cousin who I sat next to at Celtic Park, Scott He was right into them So in the year on the lead up to the Glass Vegas album I think I must have saw them maybe about five or six times Including an infamous gig at the Greenside Hotel In uh, Glen Rothes in, in your neck of the woods Which was... Interesting, it was a, the band were really, really good by this point. But before the band went out on, there was a mass brawl in the middle of the the dance floor and this woman absolutely pummeled her husband or partner or brother, whoever it was. She gave him an offy tank. Him. And I just remember me and the bass player sitting there killing ourselves laughing at this woman getting dragged off this guy. It was such a... What could you say a, a Glass Vegas moment? Actually, <laughs> um, well, I'm glad you. I'm glad you didn't say it was such a Fife moment, Kevin. I thought you were being disparaging to the ancient kingdom of Fife there for a minute. But that gig, obviously, we've spoken a fair bit about Glass Vegas when we had James Allen on a very earlier episode of a Celtic State of Mind. Still one of the most popular episodes that we've had. And at that time, we spoke about, you know, the introduction, the MySpace, the home tapes. And since then, I've discussed that particular gig you referred to there. And that was one of the gigs that my big brother's band actually supported Las Vegas that night. So you would have seen them in action as well. Obviously, completely memorable because... uh, (laughs) Can't remember it. (laughs) You can't remember it, of course. It must have made a huge impact. But you're absolutely right. It was I asked James Allen about the the home tapes, and he wasn't all that aware of who did it. He thinks it might have been Rab that uploaded them. Ah, uh-huh. um, I can remember the night of the Greenside gig. The night before, uh, Geraldine had appeared on MySpace, and Celtic were playing Aberdeen the following day, and I'd been to the football. My cousin says there's somebody driving through to Glen Rothes to see Las Vegas. You going to go? I went, my wife never spoke to me about the first day, the time I got back. So I were releasing stuff on MySpace all the time and it was was really quite good to catch them at that point. So when the album came out, it was really interesting to see how the album had developed from the home tapes. And I must admit, I mean, the album, but like themselves, it's a powerful, poetic beauty, an album. 
It's actually like, what, what could I say? It's like a, a rose growing within darkness and noise. That's what, that's what I see it as. I see it as this beautiful thing surrounded by chaos. And it's a, for me, it's a very, very Scottish album. I think James Allen is a great lyricist, a great storyteller, which a lot of good Scottish guys are, creative types. And one of the things that always stands out for me about, and Scottish bands seem to have this, they have a great use of swearing in songs. The swearing sounds natural. You can what I mean? You can how sometimes you listen to stuff and you hear guys being interviewed or are on podcasts and they swear. And you go, you're just putting that on to make yourself seem hard. It's or, not part of their normal uh, vernacular. Uh, whereas when Las Vegas used it in certain certain bits, especially like in Daddy's Gone and My Own Cheating Heart Makes Me Cry, you go, that's the vernacular that would be used in those situations. If you're the character in that song, you would be swearing. And it's a great use. <laughs> and, and it's one of, one of those things that um, sometimes you think folk just swear for the sake of swearing. There's an artistic reason for the for them swearing in these songs. And it just suits the whole noise, the Mary Chain influences, the Motown influences, the Velvet Underground influences in that as well. And like a lot of decent, decent Scottish bands, it contains great pop songs. And it's one thing about Scotland, they can actually be the most gloomiest gits, but they can actually write a drop-dead gorgeous tune to go with it. It's perfect, it's brilliant. I do think that, you know, sometimes out of despondency and darkness can come this positivity, and that comes through art and through music. And when you're looking at the the actual playlist of this Las Vegas album, as much as I loved the, the home tapes, I think there was a rawness and an innocence about them. And when you listen back now to the album, the LP that was released, what strikes me is just the power, the actual power of the songs from the very first track, Kevin, Flowers and Football Tops. It used to be called Flowers and Football Taps, did it not? On the home tapes. Even just the sentiment of that particular song being written about, you know, the tragedy that was the kidnap and murder of Chris Donald, 15-year-old kid in a racially motivated act that was, uh, you know, it was so alarming at the time. It was horrendous, actually, when you look at the grisly details of that and to turn such an event into such a powerful statement as Flowers and Football Tops is just, you know, it takes some doing. When you listen to the, the album versions of these tracks now, Kevin, maybe it's just through time I've grown to appreciate these versions over the, the home tapes. It really is the power. It strikes you. It's got that hair standing on the back of the neck quality about it. You mentioned Geraldine there. And my famous uh, gig that I saw Las Vegas as an unsigned band that was was actually in Dunfermline at the um, Carnegie Hall, and their merchandise seller was Geraldine. Her name is Geraldine. No sure if she was also a social worker. Who knows? Maybe James could tell us that. It was the same girl, same lassie, aye, and selling all the merch, the pink t-shirts, the pink Las Vegas t-shirts. I remember. But I mean, you look at that album, and I'm you know I'm not forgetting about what are known as album tracks, Kevin, but. You're looking at four bona fide classics on that LP. The opening track, Flowers and Football Tops, Geraldine, Daddy's Gone, It's My Own Cheating Heart. Four songs that are gracing one album. It's an astonishing piece of work. Definitely, and it's if I was any decent at songwriting or if I had written My Own Cheating Heart Makes Me Cry and I've said this before, I would give up after it. I mean, how can you, for me, how can you better that song? How can you better the emotion in that song and what is actually captured in the lyrics and that, the whole, it, it's fantastic. But you have to give the band credit as well, not just James. I mean, you look, you look at Geraldine or you listen to Geraldine. How many times have you heard Geraldine getting played in sports show and Sky Sports, like over top of goals? It, it's got that catchiness. It's got that universal catchiness as well. So we'll have to give the band a, a great bit of credit as well that they managed to turn James Allen's lyrics into something so magnificent, something so powerful, something so... It's a, it's a classic Scottish album for me, a classic Scottish album. But it is. I do know what you're saying about the home tapes. You listen to the versions there, there there's a fragility in the versions on the home tapes, which is not an album. It's more a band... 
it's more the live sound, really. But on the home tapes, you've got the track, The Prettiest Thing on Saltcoats Beach, and that was left off the album. And when you listen to The Prettiest Thing on Saltcoats Beach, no band in their right mind should leave that off any album whatsoever. It's up there where we talk about B-sides quite a lot, eh? But, oh, what a song that is. I, I love that song. I do love that song. I just think, Las Vegas, because I think of what thereafter happened, they've had a trilogy of albums so far. The last one came out in 2013 when we spoke to James a couple of years ago now. He was talking about a new album being in the works. Since then, they've been far more active, haven't they? They've done a lot of gigs, a lot of the acoustic tours with James and Rab. And I'm at that stage now where I'm thinking, we're ready for a fourth Las Vegas album. You know, Las Vegas came out, they were the band that got this buzz and a lot of that was down to the way they um, were being talked up you know, in the early days by Alan McGee. And by no means, Kevin, does that guarantee success because there's been so many bands that have fallen by the wayside after being championed by Alan McGee. I'm pretty sure his success rate's better than most, but, you know, he's he's obviously pushed a lot of bands that didn't go anywhere. Las Vegas had the songs to back it up. The debut album was an astonishing success. They were selling records in America. They were touring in the States. What do you think, I'm not going to say it went wrong, because I don't think it went wrong, but what do you think happened in the Las Vegas trajectory that you've got the second album coming out three years later, and then the third album. I've got all three albums, but it is the debut one that seems to be synonymous with, with Las Vegas. I think the following two albums, there's some great songs on them, and my problem with this with the second album always was it sounded far too polished for them, and I've seen them live doing stuff from all three albums live, and when they play the songs from the second album live, they make far more sense than what they do recorded to me. I think with the second album as well, the problem was it was released then they were dropped by the record company right away there was no real promotion and of the album the record company didn't really back it things move on sometimes bands maybe they hit that trajectory then they hit the plateau they flatten their curve if they go with a topical term in these times and they get to the level that they're meant to be at and I'm not saying that Las Vegas didn't deserve to be bigger than selling at the Barrowlands but there's an artistic freedom that comes with no being that big and maybe the record company pushing them to do something that they didn't want to do has seen them stick to their guns and has gave them the room to breathe and I'm sure I read in the last couple of weeks that the that their fourth album is forthcoming and it was meant to be released this year but obviously with everything that's going on it might be delayed further as well they've done a lot of work around about the first album everybody says it was an overnight success but I'll quote Noel Gallagher it was the longest overnight success ever and we're talking about three years eh, of them doing the gigs then the year leading up to the album they were constantly on tour the album exploded they're constantly on tour again then you've got no the adage then they get shoved straight back into a studio and get told you need to do another album instead of sometimes at that point taking the sit back and going right we'll, we'll see what we've done here burn out maybe but there's some good stuff on both their, both their other albums but as you say the Las Vegas Las Vegas just seems to be their, their, their zeitgeist album and it seems it seems to be even when they done the 10th anniversary it still it brought a lot of people back into contact with them at that time in the sold out venues up and down the country it's interesting that you do mention McGee because we've spoke to there was other bands at that point as well like Frightened Rabbits had their first album out at that time and so did The Twilight Sad when we done the interview with John Paul Mason and I remember him saying to us that there was a wee bit of bemusement and the Rabbits camp and also the Twilight Sad that Las Vegas had exploded the way that they had when those bands kind of thought well, well, we're just as good. We've just produced as good stuff. But again, a lot of it's down to luck. A lot of it's down to Alan McGee knowing who he knew. And that hard luck story is commonplace in music, just the same as it's commonplace in football. Yeah, there's a huge amount of luck. But what I would also say as well, as much as I like the Twilight Sad and Frightened Rabbit, when you listen to that First Class Vegas album, what they do have is they have got universal appeal with the four songs that I've already mentioned, but others on that album. I think in the music industry, do they call it the crossover songs? You know, a song that, that can actually get an audience of what you would probably call casual music listeners. If you hear that a song on the radio, 
you know, Las Vegas had songs like that that, you know, they were, yeah, they were poppy because of the melodies in them, but they were also real and, and raw records that had grown from the, the feedback tinged Mary Chain influences that they had maybe in the earlier days. But they had that crossover appeal. Whereas, you know, if you just randomly pulled someone and asked them about a frightened rabbit song, name a, a frightened rabbit song, name a Twilight Sad song, they might struggle to do that. Whereas Las Vegas definitely were getting into the realms of being more of a popular band. And you can you can hear that in the first album. And I'm by the way, I'm not I'm not down crying the other two out bands that I've mentioned because most of the bands that I invest in, most of the bands I love are not popular. They don't have that crossover appeal, you know. Whereas I think Las Vegas in the first album they certainly did. Uh, probably not album two and three, to be honest. So it will be interesting to see what album four brings, Kevin. I think everything happens for a reason, and there was a reason that Glass Ve- that that album exploded, and for me, and it, there was a reason that the Frightened Rabbits exploded a couple of years after. It's a reason that the the Twilight Sad are now as big as what Glass Vegas w- were at that point. It, it, it's all down to your time. I think and, and I do maybe agree with you that the, the songs that Las Vegas were producing at that time had that crossover were stronger at that time for me that's what it basically comes down to it will be interesting to see about the fourth album I'm sure we'll get James back on to tell us about it so I am, I'm looking forward to the fourth album I'm looking forward to going to seeing them again actually I'm looking forward to going to any live gig to tell you the truth ah well this is the thing yeah any kind of live event that doesn't involve you staring at four walls Kevin you know that would be good but uh, Glass Vegas came along and part of what we do when we're looking at one of the albums for Scheme of Celica's is obviously we look at Celtic and it may not seem right for you because you were into Las Vegas long before this album came out to be looking at the season 2008-2009. It's a season, Kevin, that I always look back on this campaign with a great deal of disappointment and regret because Celtic, for me, were up against a really poor Rangers side and we threw that away that season, you know. We were going for four in a row under Gordon Strachan. What do you think it was? We lost the league by four points. We drew our last two games, nothing each. We couldn't have scored against Hibs or Hearts. And a win, when you're looking at the margins there, a win in both of the games by 1-0 would have put us on level points and level goals. Where did it all go wrong for Celtic this season? Because when you look at the, for example, the victory in the, the League Cup final, where even though it went through extra time, if you watch that game back, Celtic were by far the superior side. I know it took us extra time to get the goals, Kevin, but Celtic were a much better side than Rangers that season and it's very regretful it's a regret for me that we didn't win that league it's a regret for me every time we don't win a league but I just felt we were beaten by a really poor side that season I don't disagree with you it's difficult to look at that season and not just make the conclusion that it was one year too much for Gordon Strang there is rumours that he wanted to leave in the December time and he was talked out of it by Dermot Desmond Dermot Desmond to, to stay towards the end of the season we won at Ibrox at Christmas I remember that Hibs game that you mentioned there and we didn't attack until 75 minutes and my some memory of that game is our attacking creativity was a Lee Naylor long throw into the box and oh, that was a dreadful dreadful end to that season I mean even though we won the title the previous year the crack were shown in the previous year that the football was getting stodgy. Gordon was being stubborn. I mean, he is, he is stubborn, he'll admit that himself. And fair play to him. That season before, we were seven points behind him. We had played a game more and we somehow managed to win that league. And we'll always be thankful for Gordon Stratton eh, for doing that. And he showed a side to him after, the, after Tommy's death as well, which a lot of Celtic fans... I had never seen him before, but that night at Tanadice, when he's walking around with a mug, drinking his tea, that should have been his swan song. It really should have. And we should have moved on at that point. We didn't, and I think we paid the price for a manager whose maybe mind was already elsewhere, and a team who had failings even the previous season that that weren't addressed truthfully. As you say, it's a sore one to lose. The League Cup final was great, but those last two games, especially the Hibs game, are, are really quite. Even now, I can remember being absolutely devastated after that Hibs game because I knew that was it. I, I knew we we had handed any advantage, any momentum we had to the other side of the city and they had an old wily fox in Smith and they they weren't going to let that go, they weren't going to let that opportunity pass them by. No, again it's a simple thing to say 
we didn't strengthen in January. We didn't strengthen enough in January. When you look at, you know, Willow Flood and Niall McGinn coming in. Flood comes in for 150 grand. McGinn comes in from Derry City. And you think that's not enough to get you over the line here. So I think having beaten Rangers in the last game of 2008, Kevin, I was looking at the Celtic side and I thought we were shoo-ins for four in a row at that stage. We were seven points ahead. Rangers weren't a great side. But the problem, I think, that we had was we capitulated. There were issues in the camp, particularly between Aidan McGeady and Gordon Strachan. And going into January, you're looking at that thinking you do need to freshen it up. Just because, you know, there might have been a bit of a rot setting in Kevin in season four. There was a few interviews, for example, that Strachan was to give during 2009, where he was having, I probably would say, digs, he was having digs at even the Celtic support, so it was getting to them and sometimes, and it's not a magic wand and there's no guarantee, but sometimes a good January transfer window can really uh, remove all of that doubt and all of those issues and this, for me, was the main reason we didn't win the league this season What's your memories of the 2009 January transfer windows and the disappointment of that? It has to go down as the window of the failure to get Stephen Fletcher, eh? That was a long-running saga which seemed to kick up straight after the Bet Rangers didn't finish until the 1st of February. And there was numerous times during that month when we expected Stephen Fletcher to be a Celtic player. Obviously, this was the start of the politics between Rod Peter and Peter Wall. At this time, the season before, Hibbs had sold Kevin Thompson to Rangers and Scott Brown to us. And I think Hibbs dug their heels in over Stephen Fletcher and made it clear to the player that he would only be sold to England, where he ended up going to Burnley in the summer of 2009 for, I think it was £3 million. You have to have a look at it. After we bet Rangers, we had seven league games in January and February and we only won three of those league games so we basically threw it away straight after having a great victory at Ibrox and you have to think to yourself our strikers that season off the top of my head it would have been Skippy Jan Venegura Hesselink Samaras and possibly Killian Sheridan got, got a, a few games as well here and there Jan Venegura by that point was not the player he was in the first couple of seasons Scott McDonald was having a setting season slump and Samaras was just his usual big enigmatic self some games good some games uh, no interested so you could probably say that Stephen Fletcher would have made a difference to our striking options definitely would have improved our striking options whether he would have improved what was going on behind the scenes and the manager's attitude by that point attitude is the wrong thing but it was quite clear by this point and it's been proven as I've said previously that Stratton asked to leave in December he wasn't enjoying the job anymore so would bringing in Stephen Fletcher at that point made any difference might have done who knows but you look at Fletcher himself he, he went to Burnley then he moved to Wolves then he got a £12 million move to Sunderland after that eh? so he's a decent player he's had a decent career it's a, a case of what ifs and buts we did miss we did miss out there I think I think he might have made a difference but whether it's such a big the weight round their neck that's the reason that we lost the league that season I don't think so I think there was many factors and Stephen Fletcher's not just the main factor which I've seen written plenty of places if we had signed Fletcher we had won the league I don't think it is clear cut as that. It's never as simple as that, Kevin, is it? I think um, when you have a good transfer window and it freshens the place up, I'm only going by what the players say. And this might just be a stock phrase, but they do say that, you know, it kind of lifts the dressing room, depending on the people that come in. It can go the other way and you can bring someone in who actually disrupts the dressing room. But I do think that, yeah, it's a a romantic notion that Fletcher comes in, he he scores uh, prolifically for the rest of the season and we win four in a row. But we certainly did need a striker. That much is clear when when you look at the games we played in that first half of 2009, 23 games played, we only won 12 games of those 23. That's in all competitions. And we failed to score in eight of them. If you were to count the League Cup final 90 minutes, we failed to score in 90 minutes of eight of those games, which is a third of the games. So although the, the striker list that you've already mentioned, you think to yourself, you're, you're going to have goals in Skippy, you're going to have goals in Venegura Hessling, and you're going to have big occasions from Samaras, where he shines. 
but they weren't being prolific in the first half of 2009. And so a striker like Fletcher, who was on the up and up, you know, it was around about that time, I think there was talk about Real Madrid being interested. Remember that? Real Madrid being interested in Fletcher. And by the way, we're not, I don't think we're overstating or overrating the player. He cropped up in one of our articles on the website, axom.net. It was a great article actually written by Alan Morrison, who was looking at Celtic's failure to produce a striker, a homegrown striker. But there was a trend and it was a, a Scotland wide problem. We will never know what would have happened had Stephen Fletcher joined us in January. But as you already have mentioned, it was maybe the beginnings of an issue between Rod Petrie and Peter Lowell that reared its ugly head later on and probably sped up the departure eventually of Brendan Rodgers over the John McGinn saga. And obviously, Rod Petrie had a part to play. But my frustration with Stephen Fletcher and not securing his signature is the boy wanted to sign for us. Now, one of one of these things I can understand where Rod Petrie was coming from. He had already sold their two crown jewels to Glasgow clubs and he didn't want to face the wrath of the Hibs fans again by selling us Stephen Fletcher. And also, you know how it looks from the outside looking in, how we conclude these deals. We seem to go low ball first bids, then go up in increments and offer all sorts of bonuses, clauses and stuff like that. Eh? So who knows? We didn't, we didn't know the inner workings of, of how this deal didn't happen. But the bottom line was it didn't happen and it probably cost us it was one of the reasons that we didn't win four in a row, but it's only one of the reasons. For me, it's not the main reason. No, you're absolutely right. And I often wonder, with regards to deals like that, Kevin, when you just can't get them over the line, it does come down to money. So Rod Petrie would only be digging his heels in until a big enough offer came in. Let's be honest. And that big enough offer for a Scottish football team, even then, we're not talking chucking another million or two million pound onto the, the fee or the offer that you've already uh, made. You know, you're only talking a few hundred grand uh, in the case of McGinn, for example, you know. So that issue or that when two football linchpins are at loggerheads, that can be resolved and it can be resolved by money. And that, that was a big issue there. But what we did instead of bringing in Fletcher, the only business we did in that transfer window of note, and I'm not going to go through any players that came in as development players, Niall McGinn, 200 grand from Derry City, Willow Fletcher, 150 grand from Cardiff City and I think when you look at the fact that our league position went from 7 points ahead of Rangers to Rangers winning the league by 4 points it's no surprise I mean the games I was talking about we only won 12 of 23 games one of them was against Queen's Park and we scraped through against Queen's Park you know and you think to yourself would a top quality Scottish striker have made a difference that day perhaps possibly I mean that that was a, a grim grim result and that was on the back of when you look at the last few games of 2000 and eight Kevin and I know we had beaten Rangers 1-0 we beat them well that day I know it was only 1-0 in, in the last game of the calendar year but we'd also beaten Villarreal so it's frustrating more than anything when you look at a, a group of players a set of players and you more or less capitulate and that's what's happened and the big issue there or or one of the issues we're aware of was the Megidi Strachan spat which resulted in him being suspended and even when he was fit to play Strachan continued to leave him out he wasn't even on the bench for the first game back that you know, we played Dundee United and threw away a two goal lead. Having remembering back that period, I seem to remember a lack of creativity and a lack of drive for the middle of the park. And you're probably right, his treatment of Magidi wasn't correct. The team needed Magidi, he needed his creativity. And Barry Robson got injured as well. And I, f- I, re- I do think that we missed Barry Robson's drive towards the end of that in, in that season for long, long periods. So maybe even though the strikers were misfunctioning, there's other reasons why why we weren't winning games, why we weren't scoring goals and how we drew so many games. We just couldn't get them over the line, eh? That, that's what I'm saying. I, I do think there's a bigger, bigger picture here rather than just Stephen Fletcher would have saved us. There was more things that needed fixed rather than just bringing in another striker for me anyway. But it probably had run its course under Strachan and I remember the speech you're talking about. It was after the Tommy Burns game, which effectively was Strachan's last game, wasn't it? The benefit match. Mm-hmm. And uh, he came on the, on the park and obviously that's when he stated that he wasn't born a Celtic fan, but he's left the club as a Celtic fan, to paraphrase what Gordon Strachan said that day. But the disappointment for me is we were up against a really poor side, but then that says how poor we were, that we weren't able to clinch the title. And these things, it's like what you're talking about with Las Vegas. It's the same in football. Things happen in cycles. Strachan leaves with 
we then go into a, a period of even further decline under Tony Mowbray but without that we then don't have Neil Lennon and then the beginnings of the nine in a row that we're, we're still enjoying to this day Kevin so it's one of the things I regret whenever Celtic don't win regardless if it's domestic European but this is the one season I think that really stands out for me and obviously we've given them a bit of an advantage and then with the appointment of Tony Mowbray it's really added to that. They, they went on to win three league titles on, on the bounce didn't they before Neil Lennon was able to break that monopoly. Definitely, I mean what you've got to remember um, what I remember about the previous season is our midfield was struggling. We had signed Scott Brown the previous summer and he was struggling, he was struggling. He, had, he was being asked to play a different role in the side then the luck was... I always see they call it a title for Tommy, but the the two boys that won that title for for me when I look back were Barry Robson and Paul Hartley. Barry Robson and Paul Hartley were fantastic in that season running. They guys dug in and dragged us basically over the line and dragged us through that period. And um, but there's only so often you can do that. And there's only so often you can get away with that. And as I've says, it probably was a season too far. But you're right, it's part of a bigger jigsaw. Gordon Stratton brung. Neil Lennon and his backroom stuff and those on those two seasons that we're talking about here, eh? So it's ended well for us and as you say, everything, everything happens, it's like a big massive jigsaw and we can look back on it with a bit of regret, but what's happened happened, we can't change it. It's only our future that's unwritten, ain't it? No, you're absolutely right. And as well as Celtic, I must admit, Kevin, I didn't think when you told me 2008 was going to be the year we were focusing on for this episode of Scream of Celica. In my mind, it didn't jump out as being a vintage year for music. However, having dug through the old record collection and had a look at uh, the records that were released this year, it was much better than expected. What other albums made an impression on you in 2008, Kevin? Strangely enough, this was the year I know the band had been going for a wee while, but this was the year I really got into Elbow they released Seldom Seen Kid this year I, I'm su- I suppose it was a bit of a bandwagon jumper because obviously One Day Like This was released and it was a massive massive hit for them that year but what I really liked on that album was the first single that Grounds for Divorce that going to see Las Vegas and Fife on a Saturday night it was nearly Grounds for Divorce right enough but <laughs> <laughs> so you had that album which, is, which got me down an, an elbow rabbit hole where again I really love uh, Guy Garvey's lyrics and the way that their songs are so empty and simplistic but sound massive. Another band that's good at doing that released an album that year, Spiritualised released uh, songs in A and E. Spiritualized. Every year that we do Scream of Celica that Spiritualized released an album, we're going to mention them because they are, quite frankly, one of the best bands of all time. Now, people will be thinking, ah, you're just trying to be hipster. Honestly, type into YouTube Spiritualized Live. There's so many performances that are professionally filmed. There's one in Reykjavik and the performance, the songs, the gospel, uh, you know, the strings, everything about Spiritualized. They've never released a bad album and like you say, that they had released uh, ladies and gentlemen in the packaging I managed to get one of the CDs that was made up like a paracetamol box you know you had to break it to get the CD out and they had this whole theme running like it, obviously prescription drugs because Jason Pierce is a self-confessed addict so th- this was the latest album what's your, your memories of songs in a and I love the fact that it was a play on J- Jason Pierce main man spiritualised had been in hospital quite a bit with a lung problem and he nearly died so he was in accident and emergency quite a lot and and the spiritualised songs, they've got two chords, A and E. So I, I love the way that he played with that in the title. The best song on that is probably the most poppiest song that he's ever written. And he's still and it's still in the sets just now when he does play live with Soul on Fire. Great song. Just encompasses everything that you want. Gospel, heartache, drug addiction. It's, it's, what a great a great song. Absolutely ma- massive song. But everything you said there, if anyone's not listened to Spiritualised, they might be thinking, wow, that's deeply depressing. They're not. They're not. When you listen to Spiritualised, they're so uplifting. You know, the songs are incredibly uplifting. And yes, another classic Spiritualised album. Any others from 2008 that were pivotal? The Verve released fourth. I know it probably disappeared because the band split up soon after it again. But there's some great tracks on that album. The opening track, Sitting Wonder has got like a sort of breakbeat that sounds a bit like Uncle and David Holmes and I think the single that they released Lover's Noise is, is a great song is an absolutely fantastic song but again it's an album that's sort of lost but, uh, within the cause of the politics of 
the band at that time, the fact that the self imploded quite quickly after they returned. There's there's a good documentary on YouTube which when Fourth was released, it was released as a CD DVD package and there's a Verve documentary called Space and Time and so it's about it's a 50 minute documentary it's like 25 minutes of them their early reformation shows in Glasgow Manchester and Blackpool then there's some footage from a festival somewhere have a watch it and have a look at the the festival footage they were absolutely knocking it out the park when they returned they played Glastonbury in 2008 as well watch that on YouTube that's one of the best hour and a half she'll spend what a band a phenomenal band and I have been to see Richard Ascroft solo quite a lot and he's never reached that peak. He, he needed the three other guys around him for to create that sonic noise. You could go through the solo albums that Richard Ascroft has released and we have discussed them over the piece Kevin and you can pick out classic songwriting from each album but I think as a band and as a, as a live force there's no way he's going to recreate that because each part of that band was pivotal to the sound you know and in particular Nick McCabe who there's obviously personality clashes or egos or who knows what's at play with bands I must admit I'm a massive uh, Ver fan but with this particular album I reviewed it when it came out and I slated it totally slated it and I think it's maybe skewed my own opinion of that album for more because I've never really invested in it since but it's there so I'll dig it out and I'll go back because it is one of my, my favourite bands the Verve so obviously I'm going to give it a bit of time anything else that uh, you recall from back in 2008 The Primal Scream released Beautiful Future a good album two great tracks on an Uptown and Glory of Love and Oasis we discuss Oasis quite a bit here but Oasis released their last ever album called Dig Out Your Soul and again it's a bit psychedelic to tell you the truth but it's often forgot about and it doesn't deserve to be forgotten about because it is a good it's a great Oasis album the first four songs Bag It Up The Turning Waiting For The Rapture and Shock Of The Lightning are classic Oasis classic no songwriting and they just seem to have been forgotten about especially Bag It Up Bag It Up's a great start to an album sounds really rough really glam everything that you would want in an Oasis song that's got it eh and again it's an album that's just sort of it's never commented on or quoted when people are talking about Oasis albums I know and it is when I look at the the history of Oasis and the discography for me people go back to the first three albums but really in effect the first three albums probably were definitely maybe Morning Glory and the Master Plan right even though that's released as a compilation it's a vastly superior album to Be Here Now you know and then this particular album for me is the best that they had done since those days and I know it's a different sound but it's the best LP things like Standing on the Shoulders of Giants is patchy you know there's a few tracks on it but it's a patchy album you said the first four tracks on this are standout tracks I would agree with you but I would say the first eight had the makings of a classic album and it tails off a wee bit near the end with the last three tracks otherwise we'd be talking about this album in the same vein as the first couple of albums that Oasis released I think it's unusual that it isn't referenced as much because when you think about even things like uh, Falling Down I'm Out of Time the, these are impeccable Oasis songs but I reckon it's because it's the breakup album you know it's not referenced as much or as fondly as some of the earlier ones which is unfortunate because I felt that Oasis were coming back into a stride where if they'd followed this up Kevin down the same roads because there's a bit of experimentation like you say there's a bit of psychedelia Amorphous Androgynous had done a few remixes of some of their records and it was like different class some of the remixes around this album are well worth listening to I know that there's like bonus uh, releases and all that but some of the remixes were outstanding it's just a shame really that they broke up when they did because this was to coin that overused musical term a return to form Kevin that's what I would have described it as a return to form I do wonder if no had maybe put his foot down a bit as you mentioned the first eight songs and it tails off towards the end as Andy Bell and Gem and Liam's songs then get introduced to the album I've often wondered that Noel's first solo album there's some songs on that which he says I there's versions of Oasis doing them eh? and I often wonder if that if he would have put his foot down on that album and says right now we're going to do Stop the Clocks I'm going to stick a couple of the tracks that were on his first solo album onto this album if you would have had that classic Oasis album for me anyway it is their breakup album and it's, it's, for me it's maybe their first album since the original band broke up where 
they seem to feel comfortable with their parts in it for me but obviously Liam didn't and Noel didn't and it's ended up turning what it's ended up being eh? but anybody out there should actually go and if you haven't listened to that album in, in years go and get a listen it's a psychedelic glam rock master for parts of it anyway other albums I would uh, throw into the mix for anybody who wishes a wee recommendation during the lockdown Kevin MGMT I'm sure everybody's heard it Oracular Spectacular it's one of the ones that it's quite an upbeat album and maybe you should give it a wee a wee chance to listen to it as well as some of the others on my list here Kings of Leon Only by the Night I'm a big Kings of Leon fan anyway Fleet Foxes the eponymous album here's one for you Scarlett Johansson Anywhere I Lay My Head Ooh. seriously check mm. check it out Scarlett Johansson's album that from that year Bon Iver for Emma Forever Ago great album if you've not already listened to that Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds Dig Lazarus Dig Mogwai one of your favourite bands with the Hawk is Howling the Gaslight Anthem the 59 Sound this is a for me when I heard it I just thought it was a it was a band that would appeal to fans maybe of um, a certain era of Bruce Springsteen so if you're into a bit of old Springsteen then try out the Gaslight Anthem and finally our friend Edgar Jones released an album that was Mercury Music Award nominated called The Masked Marauder. Wow. Now, this is one of the albums that Edgar's famous for. I would recommend The Masked Marauder plus all of the above, Kevin. And what actually was a much stronger year for music than I thought when you pitched 2008 to me this week. So thanks for that. And I'll go back and listen to some of the albums that I've been uh, neglecting over the last few years, including... The Verve. I've listened to a lot of the later Bon Iver stuff, so I might pick up on that. And you mentioned Mogwai, uh, as we discussed in the Mogwai podcast. It wasn't to much, much later that I got into Mogwai, so I wouldn't have listened to Mogwai that year. But I would recommend anybody go to YouTube and have a look for that Verve documentary in them at Glastonbury and for yourself to re-listen to Fourth. I'll do that. I'll listen to Fourth as long as you listen to Scarlett Johansson. And we'll leave it at that, Kevin. But thank you once again for your contribution to Scream of Celica. And I look forward to hearing what the next album is going to be, Kevin. No problem, Paul. Thanks very much for having me on to blather about football and music. And hail, hail, everybody. Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.